to be honest, a lot of work comes by word of mouth. If people know that in the industry that you're doing good work and people see physically finished buildings, it's more likely that you will get a referral. Today, I will be speaking with Tosi Oshinowo, Nigerian native and founder of CM Design Atelier. She has an impressive background that includes design and architectural degrees from Kingston College in London, a degree in urban design from the Bartlett School of Architecture, and an architectural diploma from the Architectural Association, also in London. More recently, she's been the creator of the second Lagos Biennale, and in 2023, she is the curator of the Sharjah Architecture Triennale. Using her creative design skill and strong ties to the Lagos arts and culture scene, uh, Tosi designs period statement pieces with African contemporary flair and deeply embedded in African culture. As the founder of the architectural consulting company CM Design Atelier, Oshinowo and her team have curated impeccable designs from corporate to creative projects and personalized to their clients' tastes. She's got an incredible portfolio of work, including projects like the Maryland Mall in Lagos, the Bronze Face Shield Collaboration, the Coral Pavilion Beach House, and the Garanam Village in Northwest Nigeria. In today's episode, we will be discussing the potential of working in emergent economies such as Nigeria, the power of an MBA in the business of architecture, which Tosi did uh, in, in Madrid, in the school there, and she discussed how this changed her approach and paradigm uh, of doing business. She goes into a lot of depth about negotiations, sales, and marketing. And we also discuss the importance of developing a personal brand. So lots of gold here. Sit back and relax. Tosi Oshinoa. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. Tosin, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. So you are an architect. You're yeah. the founder of CM Design Atelier. Uh, you're you're currently in in Lagos. Um, yes, I know that you've you studied for a while at the AA in in London. Um, right. Probably around right. the same time that I was at the Bartlett, just up the road, sort of <laughs> mid two thousands, right? Yes, yes, yes. And um, I know that you spent a little bit of time working at OMA and SOM, and then perhaps the best part of a decade ago, um, you set up CM Atelier. And ever since then, you've been doing some really exciting work and you know, serving uh, displaced communities. Um, you've been an advocate um, around uh, the diversity in the profession um and you know and really kind of holding the flag of like the power of architecture creating identity for for people um so i guess that the, the first question is um how did cm design atelier come about what was the the impetus for for starting that practice so like you had mentioned i i worked a short period at som and then i worked at oma in rotterdam and i moved back to nigeria in 2009 and I initially worked for a local practice, James Cuba Architects. And I think um, it, it, I really started the practice out of, I guess, more frustration. I had gone to a really good design school and worked at design practices. And coming back to Nigeria, I just felt like I wasn't doing design. I was doing architecture. I was producing buildings. But it was more of a business-led office. And so there mm. wasn't a big emphasis on aesthetics. So I didn't feel fulfilled ultimately. And I just felt like skills that I had trained in, that I had learned, I wasn't using. And it was really more of an itch that that really was what brought about the practice. And I initially started by a little odd job here and there in between work and then realizing slowly that this was more interesting, more mm -hmm. fulfilling, and that I really wanted to experiment more in that line. And so what I did do was take a sabbatical 
from my office <laughs> as a safety net, just to make sure that was this going to work or was I just uh, having some nostalgic ideas of what possibly practice could be. But mm -hmm. I did realize that, you know, I was getting the opportunity to really do what I wanted. And I wasn't sure if it was going to make money, <laughs> but I was a lot more fulfilled. And so I just thought, okay, well, I, I, I did feel it was worth the gamble then to step away after three months and say, let me face this and see what I could make of, of, of going out on my own. Mm. I, and I know you also um, completed an MBA in yes. Madrid, one of the, yes, one of the only places in the world that does an MBA specifically in the business of architecture. Exactly. And this was so instrumental as an entrepreneur because um, we're taught about design, we're taught about, you, you learn how to communicate with the clients in an office, you learn how to be a good administrator as, as mm -hmm. a project architect. But unless you're preview to management, you don't really understand anything about the business of, of running a practice. And so I, I left the office in Nigeria, um, JCA, and, you know, I was freestyling. There was a lot of things that I didn't know that I was having to fall over and realize, okay, that's not the way to do it. Not knowing also the right way to do it, but knowing what not to do. And when I, during the lockdown, as we were all online, I found this course on Arc Daily and I thought, oh, this is interesting. And I attended one lecture because they had a lot of online lectures and then they make you fill this form. And you don't realize someone's going to call you later. <laughs> you, I you, know you that double, game, very clever. Yeah, you double with the idea, but you never think, oh, I'll take it seriously. You know, it's one of those things that you'll fill the form and think you'll change your mind later when you think about how much you're going to have to spend. But then I got a call and it was very encouraging. And then I started to really think about it. I started to really think about it and realize that, yes, this is definitely something I want to do. And so I, I took the bull by the horns and yeah, I, I ran with it. Um, I, I, I understood what I loved about the course was the fact that it was part time, which meant that I didn't have to step away from life. Um, right. It meant that I could apply the skills I was learning immediately, you know, in my everyday practice. And um, I would get a qualification and obviously meet people as well meet other practitioners, because ultimately the great thing about an MBA is that you're learning from other people as well. You get case studies um, about precedent business case uh, scenarios, but then there are people within the classroom who also have experience in their own countries. And then you also realize that we're all dealing with the same problems. Nobody wants to pay architecture fees, <laughs> irrespective of what market you sit in. Some markets pay better than others, but we are all dealing with the same problems. And mm -hmm. you know that realizing one that you're not sitting at the bottom barrel of the world in Lagos, Nigeria, we're all in it together. And realizing that if you apply simple skills and logic that you can actually change, you can change the running of your business irrespective of where you are with a bit more knowledge of how mm -hmm. best to approach business. And that was what was great about the program. What, what, what were some of the things or the, some of the skills that actually you hadn't been focusing on before, but then out of the MBA, you were really like, okay, these are the, these are the pillars of a successful practice. I mean, to be honest, some of them are actually very obvious now to me, which I didn't have. So I'll give you an example. I didn't know how to negotiate fees. It sounds so simple, but I hadn't got a clue. There was a simple workshop that we did. Never, ever let your client put the fee on the table first. It is mm -hmm. always easier to negotiate down than to negotiate up. And usually creatives are always very shy. They don't like to talk about money. And so you always think, oh, let me not be forward and let the client put the the, the fee on the table. But if you're dealing with a the developer, they will never give you what, what you deserve because at the end of the day, they're about profit. So it's really, really important to put it down immediately. And then you have your, you have your window that you're willing to negotiate within and you know, you're not going to take anything less. Mm -hmm. And also the strength to know that it's okay to walk away. Not every job you need to do, not everyone should be your client. So that was important. I had never written a business plan for my practice. This is another big no-no that a lot of uh, entrepreneurs do. Because we deal with service, it, it kind of makes sense that you, you, you earn from your fee, but you never kind of think about the bigger picture of what you want to achieve in five years. Do you want to scale your business? Do you want to stay a small practice? These are all decisions that should be made intentionally and not let life and business just happen to you. And I was forced to do this. Um, there was a particular module that we had, the business of architecture, which I feel was the most valuable. Um, and we had to submit a paper in phases. We had to submit initially to create a business. 
and then to build a business plan for it. And it was actually quite difficult to do because I've kind of freestyled and I was now forced mm -hmm. to really think rationally about it. And I did realize that it was worth it because I realized that even the process of deciding how many people work in your team, how do you promote in your team? How do you reward? How do you sustain your team? These are all elements that I wasn't really thinking about. And then also the importance that HR plays in a, within an architecture practice. When you work as a um, particular, even small or big office, architecture is service, it's about the people. No matter how much money a firm makes, if you don't have the hands to deliver the work, you don't have anything. How do you keep your team happy? How do you keep an architecture team happy when you might not always have money? It's not always about rewarding in cash. It could be rewarding in kind, rewarding with elevation, rewarding with, you know, um, membership of a club. You know, th there are different ways that you can make people feel value because people will stay if they feel valued, not because you yep. pay them over the top. So, you know, understanding these kind of soft intangibles was really important. And I had no experience in any of this. And I think generally... Um, the, the person who took us for the HR course, she said it, that so few people are specialists in HR for design. Mm. And so it's so important because it's such an emotional, th these are emotional professions. People don't become billionaires being architects. So if you think you're going to throw money at people, it's, it doesn't really work either. People do it out of passion. And if you understand why people would stay in this profession, then it's easier to be able to retain them, hopefully. So, I mean, just those three things really, really did stand out to me. Yeah, well, that's that's very wise. That's very interesting, actually, is to is to kind of start to accommodate and recognize that it's in part a passion, you know, a, the passion and the love of architecture that fuels a lot of employees and that there is this a different relationship. It's not like working in finance where, you know, there's obviously a much more, you know, we like money and there's the, yeah. the success is kind of measured in financial terms predominantly um as you know in architecture it's not it's about the kind of the quality and the product and how we're making and the, the kind of emotional you know, connection you know that we have something to that that really stands out to me now something as simple as crediting the team by name right makes a massive difference to people it's not enough to say oh this big office has done this really amazing building the little people who sat there overnight doing the drawings, are they acknowledged? You know, that makes a big difference to how people feel yeah. about themselves, about their job, and if they want to continue to work there. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned, going back to the, the first kind of pillar there, you were talking about negotiation. And this is, uh, I don't think you're alone here with this in terms of, you know, this is if, if ever we put out a piece of content and it's about why are architects' fees so low, it's always a guaranteed you know, this is how we're going to get the most amount of attention. So it kind of suggests that there is a, a problem in the industry right across about being able to negotiate fees that are that are just and fair. And we see all kinds of procurement processes, particularly in the UK, where the architect is being squeezed into <laughs> into a box of like, here's yeah. your here's your fees, here's the services. Um, what what else did you did you learn about in in terms of negotiation what does a good negotiation look like or what other things can you do to kind of um be able to kind of stand your ground with a with a with a so, more premium based fee <laughs> so first and foremost whoever deals with negotiation is not the person who deals with the project as much as possible you should separate the roles it's a lot easier to have a sterile party do the negotiation than the architect who actually interacts with the client you know, once you have a soft relationship, it's very difficult to then put on a hard hat and talk about money. So as much as possible, mm -hmm. if it's possible within the practice to separate those roles, it should be done. Yeah. It's also important to, um, to not let the negotiation drag on too long. You know, if mm -hmm. you're not doing it, it's, it's much easier to just say very early on, but also not to leave the negotiation too early. There's a bit of wisdom approach with this, but I think, um, yeah. It's good to have a good cop, bad cop. If you have someone who goes with a hard deal and then maybe you have a client who wants to negotiate and say, oh, well, actually, can we review this? Then you could come in as the good cop and say, okay, well, maybe we can give a 5% discount or a 2.5% discount. But it's very, very important to separate, separate that process. Whoever handles design should definitely mm -hmm. not handle fees. 
That's very, very interesting. And it's certainly a structure that I've seen in, in lots of larger practices where they have yeah. um, either a managing partner or they have somebody whose pure role is business development. I know M OMA were very good at this in terms of having their own sort of business development hub. Yeah. So what like, I do whatever. now in my office, I'm still a small practice. I have an administrator in the office. She handles fees. So if I have a sit down conversation with a client first time round, I'm the nice smiles. Hello. So nice to meet you. Thank you for coming to us. We're happy that our work resonates with you and that you would like to use our service. And I have the happy smiley banter and we will finish the conversation with, okay, someone from admin will contact you concerning um, engagement. And that's it. <laughs> fantastic it's fantastic i love it i love it so they've already bought into the energy and then the nice sterile person sends the email with a fee proposal and we'll handle the banter back and forth mm. brilliant so the the other part you were talking about here was the business plan and kind of having some strategic um you know foresight if you like about where you want to go identifying profitable markets or identifying the type of work that you want the practice to be doing and and obviously you're based in, in, in Lagos, which is an interesting emerging economy in yeah. itself. I mean, the whole, the whole continent is in, incredibly fascinating with so much opportunity and, 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 and enormous amount of entrepreneurial kind of, um, you know, roots, energy, if you like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah energy. Absolutely. Um, so what were some of the, you know, when you were kind of looking, looking ahead in, in a city like Lagos, what were some of the things that you were identifying as kind of very, profitable markets or markets where there was a lot of opportunity in? So what, what, what really happened in Lagos when I started, you very rarely, especially in emerging markets, you very rarely will find people who specialize. Most architects right. are generalists here. You can't afford to specialize because the industry isn't large enough to say, oh, I only handle hospitals. How many hospitals are built in Nigeria in a year? You will have no work. You can't say anybody's handling sports. That happens in well-established markets. So you have to do everything well, um, but then have certain aspects that you specialize in. So people gravitate towards you for that. So in the process of building the business plan and defining what the practice was, it became very clear to me that what we would sell our firm on was, was, was our aesthetic. So we mm -hmm. are a young practice who produces a very clean, minimalist architecture. So people will gravitate to us for that. Now, within the aesthetic, we could handle X, Y, Z typology. But the point is you would come to us for our style. Right. Yes. But something else that was really interesting about preparing the business plan, I remember our teacher said, um, how do you know how much you need to earn to keep your business running? This was a big hoo-ha because every job is different. Fees are usually calculated based on the value of the project. So you almost have to do a back and a forth. And she told us, whatever fee you make, you have to double it. You have to double your fee plus an additional 20% to be able to keep your business profitable. Yep. And so if you're not making that, it's not working. So you have to then also work back from those fees to the kind of work that you do. So for example, um, residential doesn't pay great generally. It's usually a private person who is forking out a lot of money in their minds to build mm -hmm. a house. It's very, very time consuming. They will drain you. <laughs> you know, you don't want too many residentials because yep. you might get the prestige of a really interesting bespoke design, but the amount of time you're going to spend in it and the potential fees you can earn don't justify having so many. So you have to balance that out with commercial work where no one is emotionally attached. It's being paid for by a company. You can probably get more decent fees. It might not be the most exciting work, but it will, it will, it will balance your books. And you, are able, you have to kind of do almost like a jigsaw of different types of work to be able to keep your, your money balance working and the business mm -hmm. staying profitable, being able to pay your rent, being able to pay for your software, but ensuring that you know, everything works in unison. So it's not enough to just sit and wait for the phone to ring and say, oh, who's calling and just taking every job. You have to almost look at it like a master plan and say, based on how much work I need to have, I need to have four or five jobs a year, earning X amount of money, you know, being able to cover my staff, being able to pay my rent, being able to buy, um, um, pay for my software, you know, and ensure, so it's, but you know, it, it doesn't always happen. You can't always say I want two residential and five commercial, but you need to kind of have an overview so that if you end up having too much residential, you realize that mm, maybe this is not going to 
work out long term. Maybe I hold out a bit and maybe start to um, actually look out for more commercial mm -hmm. work or put yourself out to existing clients you've done commercial work for and say, um, do you have anything we really would like to provide additional services? But it means that you become more intentional. You don't just ride with the wind wave that comes in your direction. Yeah. And then so based on that, you can decide to now scale. Okay, yeah. I need to add one more person and we'll be able to take more work next year. So, you know, it was very, 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 very um, being terribly strategic and ensuring that you can actually control your growth and not just um, finish your project, publish it and just hope that things will fall into place, which is really what most people do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, well, it's interesting what you're saying there about, you know, actually considering in a project fee, it's not just the price, it's not just the cost of, of paying people to do the work and the overheads, but you know, profit, you want to be making sure that there's a healthy profit margin inside of this, in this. And if you're going to be looking at your fees and taking profit off the top of it, and then taking a bit out of it for all the overheads, and then you're left with how much you've got to pay people's salaries, then that's a very, that's a, a different way to be looking at fees. I mean, again, it sounds very obvious. And maybe a lot of architects will do this when they're setting the fees, but then managing that process whilst you're delivering yeah. the project is also another um, another kind of set of tools and awareness that's needed to make sure that you're protecting that profit because it's very easy, as you say, if you've got a residential client who's getting upset about something or you know, they're asking for lots of changes that before you know it, you've blown your a lot allowance for how many yeah. hours you should be spending on the on And the also project. what was really important about doing the master plan, particularly with the residential, is to know when you've done too many hours for the fee that's been charged. Right. And knowing when to stop, because again, you know, when you have an emotional client who is going off and off and off and changing and changing, it's also very difficult to have that conversation that um, it's not working anymore. <laughs> but as far as they're concerned, you haven't done the final deliverable. And so I think also being mindful to document and prepare the client from the beginning that um, we do have milestones, but we do have a realistic allocation for the time that will be spent on this. And when we do go over, especially if you have formally signed off and you ask us to go back, we are within our right to charge an additional fee. Difficult conversation to have. And yeah. it's more difficult to do that when you've gone past the initial negotiation because now they're dealing with you directly. So if you bring in this admin person, it's always very strange. Because <laughs> like, why are you bringing someone again? Oh, is it now to charge us the money? <laughs> but, you know, it's... <laughs> It's very delicate. It's very delicate because this is always an, at the end of the day about relationships. Yeah. So how, how do you kind of monitor these things inside of your business then when you're, when you're kind of, you've got a project on and you're working through it? What sorts of tools and devices and mechanisms have you got in place to make sure that you're keeping an eye on those hours and you know when you're about to kind of go, go beyond the, the limits, if yeah. you like? I think, I think, to be honest, no matter no matter how much education one has, everyone kind of goes over. But it's hoping that you plan a bit better. We keep timesheets, yeah. particularly for each project. Yeah. You know, we have timesheets. We have weekly timesheets. You have to log everything in and then we monitor them. We do go over, but, you know, it's, um, it's being able to flag when you're getting into the red zone and know what to do because that's the easy yep. bit to forget. You know, you get excited, you're enjoying the project, you're looking at the fact that it's going to be beautiful when it's finished, but you have to remember that you have to keep oxygen, the oxygen coming into the business. And as long as you keep a flag and you keep your hours, it's clear, you know when you're going over. And then it yep. might be sometimes, especially if it's dealing with an emotional client, I keep mentioning an emotional client, you may eventually maybe, instead of going back to them and saying, Oh, I need to charge extra fees. Something else that we do is to put a more junior person on it who costs a lot less money. And I can ah, also very smart. learning on the job and just obviously just check and make sure that they're doing it, that, that mm -hmm. they're, they're not going to completely go in the wrong direction. But it's an easier way to save a face with a client who's being difficult and doesn't want yep. to pay extra fees by just putting more junior person who will learn on the job anyway, but it costs the office mm -hmm. a lot less money. Yeah, that's very. That's a very intelligent business move. Um, that you know, actually, it, it's it takes a little bit of thought to do that sometimes because so many architects will get into like, well, if something's going on with the project. I need to be, or that we put more senior yeah. people onto it. But actually, the the idea is to really increase your your efficiencies. Is that you've got yeah. junior people and you've got good systems, good leadership, so that they know what they need to do and they can deliver the work 
so yes. that the you know the because office is spending I mean, the least I mean, if you have anyone money. who studied architecture, I mean, they're not stupid. They, they might be inexperienced, but they've got a brain sure. and they can actually do it. And if there's somebody who is supervising and just checking, you know, once in a while, just overview, make sure that they they haven't gone off on a tangent, then they'll get the job done. You know, um, it's not rocket science, half of these things, especially when you're working in information in a building on a project. Mm -hmm. It's just adding layers of information. So once you explain to them what they need to do, they can just get on with it. And then you can get on with other things at the same time. You mentioned something very interesting about in the emerging economy there in Lagos that you need to be a generalist. And I, I've had this experience when, uh, so I've got a lot of family in places like Guyana and Suriname and and some of them are working in construction and, you know, I, I, we, we have conversations, we've done a little bit of work with them before as, a, as, an, as an architect. And I've always been like, whoa, you guys are like pitching for airports and like private <laughs> residential. <laughs> and it frightens me a little bit. I'm like, whoa, is, is you know. I'm not comfortable kind of that that's a, that's a really big spread of stuff but again it's the kind of it's a small economy it's a small in yeah. in, in Suriname for example you know there 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 isn't that amount of architects who are are specialized so how do you how do you you know there's 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 a lot of risk in that as well being a kind of generalist um I guess there is risk I think it's very important to know what you know and know what you don't know and if yeah. you do end up getting a commission that is clearly above your your expertise to partner or collaborate with someone who already has that skill set. We haven't yet been in that position, but again, you know, as architects, we don't work alone. So mm -hmm. um, the project that was recently finished for the for the UN, I'd never done anything within the developmental humanitarian sector, um, but there are engineers who work within UNDP who are very skilled, and it might not necessarily be um, the civil works, but just asking them, finding out information. There are a lot of things that are standardized in the UN, um, the VIP toilet system, you know, getting the information from them. I was an external consultant, but, you know, knowing who to go to for what can also help to ensure that you're able to deliver. I mean, doing that and doing a private residence or doing um, a, a retail center in Lagos, they're all very different. But like I said, there's so many people on a, on a consultant team to deliver a project. Um, between the solution of being a designer who's able to perform a spatial uh, solution for a project, there will be expertise that one doesn't have. And just knowing who to go to for what um, mm -hmm. is also very helpful. Something else that's really very beneficial in this environment is there's a lot of knowledge share between even practicing architects. So I have a friend who's done a museum. If I have a project, I can go to him and ask, oh, can you advise on if this will work or not. And there isn't necessarily a selfishness of people being protected. We are all competitors. So I'm not saying mm -hmm. that at the end of the day, if it comes to an actual bid, we would all, we would all submit a, um, a request for information. But if someone does get a job and I do know someone who has a knowledge base, I will ask, I mean, what's the worst? They'll say no, <laughs> yeah. you know, but more likely than not, they will actually, they will actually lend some support. So, in in terms of um, opportunities in in Lagos, and and one of the reasons why you've you kind of settled and kind of remain remain there, what 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 kind of opportunities are there for young architectural practices? I mean, it's it's great, and first and foremost, being an emerging market, there is no structures here in the sense that if you are progressive and tenacious and a go getter. It's, it's like virgin land, you know, there's no, mm -hmm. there's no well-established firm who takes all the work, you know, it, you know, all you need is the opportunity to get your foot in the door. And if you deliver, that's the reference, you know, as architects in this market, very similar to in Britain, we're not allowed to formally, we're not allowed to commercially advertise. You can get your work mm -hmm. published, you know, but to be honest, a lot of work comes by word of mouth. If people know that in the industry that you're doing good work and people see physically finished buildings, it's more likely that you will get a referral. It never happens in the immediacy. From my experience, it's usually a two to three year cycle. But once it's standing, that work will get you more work. So, so how are, what are the kind of the best routes or the ways that you found for winning new projects then? Well, we do get all as much as possible. We've, we've built up a good um, online presence. So we mm -hmm. have a good website. We get our work published. You know, we get it into magazines, um, word of mouth with existing clients. Uh, 
references from contractors, other professionals. And that's really how we've been able to kind of maneuver within our industry. What I did learn from the MBA program was to actually do more B2B business development. So actually right. going towards a developer and saying, listen, we've got this skill set, you know, do you need our service? Or going to existing developers we've worked with and, you know, just always pushing and, and being progressive. Because the thing about developers, they have a massive pull. You know, everything is based on profit. There are 100 architects all bidding for the same residential development work. You know, you have to really do push and, you know, build good relationships within those sectors so that you can continue to get um, work from from them because they're, it's a very steady stream of work. It doesn't pay a lot mm -hmm. because it's a very, very saturated market. But, you right. know, it's important to, apart from just getting the work that pays well, one has to also keep the team active, you know, it's it's just one of those professions that you know it's it can be frustrating being in this industry because I don't know how it is in other parts of the world but everyone who approaches an architect has a plan to have a finished project but there's so many things that go wrong it could be financing it could be an issue with the land it could be planning you know and so it's very difficult to also plan this little ship because you might think I've got four projects at the beginning of the year but only two went ahead or three you know how do you manage that and you need to keep your team um, active. You don't want to um, lose a team because you don't have the work. And then when the work comes, you don't have the team. So it's it's such a difficult ship to kind of balance. Um, and it just takes always having a general overview and making sure you're aware of what's happening to be able to plan accordingly. Has there been any opportunities or have you kind of put into your business plan, for example, um, other types of services so kind of kind of you know diverging away from traditional architectural services so you know move trying your own hand at development for example yes other services so i think um concerning um getting additional work i've also positioned myself as a, the principal more in the cultural space so mm -hmm. i'm an architect i have a furniture line so people normally who would not necessarily have thought they would need architectural services, who buy furniture, they know I'm an architect. If someone says, do you need an architect? Oh, I know this architect who happens to do furniture, but she's also a very good architect. I'm also a curator. So within the cultural space, there's an amplification of my profile. You know, So I'm doing things within the creative sphere that I don't necessarily practice, but because they know I'm an architect, that in itself is a ripple effect because my practice profile is also raising as my personal profile is raising. So I've done that very intentionally. Yes. Well, I, and so this is interesting. So you you have your own kind of line of, of, of furniture. And yes. how does the how do the two then kind of interact with each other? Do they do you often find that the furniture becomes a sort of like a, a kind of capture device for architectural services or the other way around? It has. It has actually, which is the irony, because um, funny enough, so architecture doesn't seem to get as much public profile as furniture, <laughs> which actually I didn't know, but it, it's what I've realized. So people would say things to me like, oh, I didn't know you were an architect, but I knew about your furniture. And then I found out you were an architect. And so well, that, that's good, because that means everything's feeding off each other. Funny enough, we get projects and we also spec our furniture in the projects as well now. So so that's a win-win, you know. Um, but, you know, the sectors or the, the demographics or the markets who, who you service in both are also very different as well. So you're more likely to get furniture for people who want to do small interior projects or, you know, they're buying stuff for their homes or they need stuff for their office. But then a building project is a very different kind of person who needs a big project and they're only going to come once or twice for your service. So it's, it's interesting, but separate, but also interconnected, but everything is kind of feeding off each mm -hmm. other. So let's talk a little bit about about personal brand because this kind of um, you know it, it kind of attaches itself as well to these different streams um, of services and products that you've that you've got. What is personal brand for you? And and the reason I bring it up as well because I you know you've you've been you've been everywhere. Your your name your your name comes up everywhere. People kept mentioning you to me as well. Um, and you know, if you go onto Dazine or something, there's loads of articles of you mentioned in it. Like you're really masterful at um, developing your own personal brand and communicating what it is that you do. And there's a, there's a compelling mission as well about what the, about the work that you do, which is obviously very relevant as well um, today and is resonating with a lot of people. Tell us a little bit about what personal brand is to you, how you've gone about 
developing it and and its relationship to to design so i think first and foremost as i didn't i didn't i don't think i initially intended to set up a personal brand yeah. but i think once this wave was rising and i was realizing the influence it was having i was like oh i'm going to take this seriously now so personal branding i guess started from the project we did in lagos maryland more it was finished in 2016 it was a very striking design at the time. It's black, massive black box with this massive LED screen on it and branding. And everyone's thinking, there are no windows here. What are they doing? This is espionage or something. <laughs> and then they find out there's this youngish looking girl who's the architect. It's such a massive oxymoron that it threw people off and it initially set the interest. So I thought, huh. And then I've got this slight obsession with glasses. <laughs> and then I realized people would say, oh yeah, that architect, that young architect who wears all those colored frames. And I thought, okay, well, this is interesting. So let me push this further. And so I said to get more frames and different colors. And, you, and then it becomes something that people associate with yes. you. And then the opportunities of people knowing that you're an architect and they think, oh, why don't I ask her for this? And it was never the same kind of project. But whenever I would deliver, it would it would really push the boundaries. And so it's almost like a fashion designer. People start to call you for all kinds of things. And then you also have to be a little bit more intentional. Mm -hmm. So you end up not doing any and everything and not having any logic or focus. And very much my work is is very much now defined about creating um, a contemporary African aesthetic that is yeah. very conscious about celebrating identity and culture, but in a with a very strong contemporary balance. And And so as I've developed this brand awareness i've also developed the message that is important that i want the practice to be sold for so irrespective of if i'm being a curator or i'm being an architect mm -hmm. or i'm doing product this same language or theme is running through all the different streams and so as they're all being amplified the practice is just one element that is also growing with everything else yeah well, let's talk a little bit about this as well the kind of yeah as you say the underlying message or intention of the work and of the and of your brand which is all kind of the same it's all melding together if you like is this idea of identity in architecture and and kind of creating an african or contemporary african identity in in modern architecture where has this been born from and and what's what's driving it in terms of like a, a like a longer vision I think really it's um, it's born from my 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 experiences. I grew up in Lagos, Nigeria. Mm -hmm. I was fortunate to be educated in the UK, but realizing that what I was being trained in was very different from where I was from, mm -hmm. and this kind of tension that exists between these two separate entities, and finding some kind of gray in between, and creating and a, a, a defining myself a niche within that because I'm I'm a product of all these experiences. And these are the experiences of many contemporary post-colonial societies, you know, finding a way to kind of merge where they were, what they've gone through and being thrown or, you know, propelled into this post-industrial state. And, 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 you know, that really is where I'm finding myself. And funny enough, in, in, in going along this journey and realizing the importance of sustainability and the challenges we're facing with global warming and, and the fact that a lot of uh, Global South locations have always dealt with this issue of scarcity. And all of a sudden, the rest of the world is realizing we all have this problem with scarcity because we're all working off depleted resources. And then trying to also now f elevate this, this, these kind of, you know, it's um, this adaptability that comes from scarcity and the creativity that exists within it. And now really take that as a forward point and say, listen, we have solutions here mm -hmm. that are really great. If I'm able to, as a designer, learn from those existing solutions, amplifying with this strong logic of identity and create a language and an architecture that is progressive, forward thinking and can work anywhere. Because ultimately, now that I've seen what I can do with this brand and elevate the status, mm -hmm. I've realized that I can work anywhere now. Yeah, I don't have to say that I'm a, an architect who, I'm a Lagos-based architect that could work in, in any market because it's the logic of it that is transfer. It's a transferable logic. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a transferable skill. But I never would have thought that these will, this would be possible um, if I hadn't started with this definition or doing this course that made me realize that I don't have to be fixed to my market. Now, it's important to know that if you do move to another market, 
that market will bring its own challenges that I'm not familiar with. Sure. And so even if I was going to move, I would probably end up collaborating or partnering with someone to understand mm -hmm. the location. Obviously, I'm not a registered architect in another country, so th there are many things to consider. But I'm 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 a lot more um, comfortable with the thought that I could actually work anywhere, which is another sign of growth. Yeah. Um, and so has there, has there been um, opportunities that have been coming up in other countries or elsewhere on the continent or even in in Europe? Or I've yeah? had I've had some I've had some interest that um, maybe about two or three years ago that I didn't necessarily pursue. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I was ready to. Um, I believe I am more ready now. The opportunities haven't come as such. But I think now that if something came, I would jump on it because I think I've acquired skills. I understand what I know and what I don't know. And I think I'm very clear on if I was going to do it, how I would go about it. And that being prepared is really important. Fantastic. And let's talk a little bit about some of the communities that you've done work with. Um, and how do you how do you create a, a, a business around serving some of these displaced displaced communities, for example, that you've done some quite stunning work for? How does how do you how do you balance that kind of because that kind of work for many practices is like they want to do it and it's important work, but then actually making it work as a business and what we were saying earlier about profit and you know how do you yeah. how do you balance these things together? Yeah. I think I was very fortunate, particularly with the project that I did, because it was actually for the UN. So right. I, I was actually paid as a consultant properly, right. you know, but, and it's opened up hopefully a door in the fact that um, the UN DP in Nigeria are not used to working with architects. It's usually just a team of engineers who deliver housing. Right. That's not really about design. Um, I do believe that the experience has shown them there is a completely different way to do this, which is very human centered and really thinks about the people. Mm -hmm. But I'm also very aware that from this kind of precedent project, there may be other organizations who are now interested. And like I mentioned, there's usually a two to three year cycle before you get the yeah. reflex of, of having the so, work finished. And we, so just for the benefit of people who perhaps don't know what the project is, could you explain what it is, okay. how you got there? <laughs> so the project was, uh, I was commissioned by um, UNDP Nigeria to design a master plan and individual housing uh, for 500 homes for people displaced from the Boko Haram insurgency. So apart from the individual housing units, there's a primary school, community center, a police post, and a marketplace to help encourage commerce mm -hmm. for this community. And it was, you know, the all, overall layout and also involved the supervision of the, of the delivery of the project. So, I mean, I, I think I was visiting on average every three weeks during the actual construction. The community have moved in. The first phase has been completed for 360 homes. Right. Um, they moved in in October. There is another 140 to be completed, which will be done next year. So what's really great about that is that apart from doing the design, I get to see the post occupation as well and to see if the decisions made work, you know, what will we change, what will we do differently next time? Because with every project, there's a, there's that process of growth and understanding design developments, construction knowledge, you know, what can we do differently? What can we do more efficiently next time? Um, but I'm, I'm very optimistic that it's been so well received. It'll be good to see what happens after that. Now, if I decide to do more hum work within the humanitarian development sector, what kind of engagement would that be? Um, it might not be UNDP, it might be another organization. I'm not actually aware how they, would how they normally charge fees in those kind of situations, or is it your social corporate responsibility give back to society? Um, the good thing about that kind of work is it does have such a massive amplifying effect because people know that it's, you know, to, to work with people, particularly a community who have been um, deprived and to really involve them in that process of design is very special. And I was very fortunate with that project to be able to involve the community. They were involved from the beginning. I went to see them mm. as proper clients, got a design brief, went back, showed them the design. You know, they were not the only people I had to speak to. I had to speak to government stakeholders. I had to speak with obviously the UNDP. So there were a lot of people to balance out their requirements, but it was really nice to involve the actual community. And so it doesn't come to them as, 
oh, they've just been given some homes. They actually knew what they were getting. They contributed. They asked for some tweaks, <laughs> even though it was the, um, the chief of the village who was speaking on behalf of everyone. But there was a, there was a women's committee who gave their feedback. There was the men's, and then obviously it was collated by the chief and then we received the information. It was interesting because there was a language barrier, so there was a lot of translators working. But, you know, I started to recognize people by faces which shows you that it's no longer just about this yeah. blob of human beings. It's about individuals, which is really fulfilling as well. Amazing. Amazing. Um, and I know that you're curating the Sharjah architecture Triennale as well this year and next year in 2023. Can, you, can yes. you give us a little, um, some little teasers of what that's going to include and what that, what that's entailed for you? As a, as a, as a, <laughs> that, as a that, that's an amazingly exciting project. You know, it's, I'm elevated into the status of being able to point and choose now, <laughs> which is great. So it's, um, it's called the, um, it's called the beauty of impermanence and architecture of adaptability. And it's really about what I was talking about. These, um, these building innovations and solutions that exist predominantly in the global South and finding practitioners who have worked with these systems and I guess creating some kind of platform where I congregate them all to showcase the interesting work that's happening, not just across architects, but designers, planners, artists who are all working within this, within this thematic. And, um, it's, it's been really great. It's involved a lot of travel to Sharjah back and forth, but also building of networks, mm. you know, I'm meeting so many people and, you know, it's the reality is that it, it is a massive platform. And what do you do with that platform? How can it also help the the business to grow? Who knows? I might have a project at least. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it, it's really great because um, you know, even if I if I didn't have the curatorship, to be able to enter into that kind of market would have been close to impossible. How would it have happened? Unless you know, you, there's always that initial crack of the egg mm -hmm. that allows you to go into the next realm. You know, and um, Again, that's why I said, you know, when, when I said earlier that, you know, I've, I've kind of very intentionally now put tentacles, you know, but it, it, it helps you to grow or to amplify in other realms that you wouldn't really have been privy to before. Yeah, brilliant. I'm toasting. I think that's the, the perfect place for us to conclude the conversation. Thank you so <laughs> much for sharing your entrepreneurial acumen and, you know, a bit of behind the scenes of, um, of CM Atelier, Design Atelier. It's been really, really fascinating speaking with you. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.